Hello and welcome to today's Confessions of a Global Changemaker. Oh, have I got an awesome interview in store for you. Uh, if you don't know this Wonder Woman of WOW already, then uh, once you finish watching this interview, you'll be the reticular activator will be going ding, 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 because she's literally everywhere. In fact, I think she's on some other news channel right now as we are speaking. So she can tell us a bit more about that. Sue, welcome to the Confession Show. Wow, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So let's dig straight in because obviously this is Confessions of a Global Change Maker. And after our chat last week or a week before, uh, we had so many confessions that we were bouncing around backwards and forwards. So, I mean, you've had such a full career and you really have picked a lane. You you are so well known. You're revered in your um in your industry for what you do. And of course, like international acclaim with so many books, so many programs, you're on TV and radio all the time. Could you share with us like what's one of the things as you've been building your brand? What's one of the biggest mistakes that you learned the most from uh, all out of all of your career? <laughs> Can only pick one. <laughs> You must be joking. There are loads. There are loads of mistakes <laughs> I've made. But uh, and, and talk about wasting money on the wrong people. Don't even get me started on that one. Um, yeah. But what kept me going all the time and what still keeps me going, because I haven't really reached my full potential yet. I know that according to my rules of my own um, aspirations. But it is to make a big difference and to leave a legacy of happy children that have strong self-esteem, great well-being, because their parents, you know, knew how to spend time with them, to play with them, to listen to them. And it just grew from there. As you know, I was a former deputy head and class teacher for, you know, around about 20 odd years, if not a little more. And uh, my whole passion shifted into then the self-esteem and the confidence and the resiliency of a child. So that then led to me uh, starting the business that then for some reason the universe just comes together when you put up some energy I was invited to write my first book in 2007 raising happy children for dummies one in the very famous black and yellow brand series that then led to radio that then led to tv that then led to be invited again to write another book in 2012 that's just led to another group of people asking me to write a book this time for children called the can do kids journal for superheroes that's out on the 21st of april so all of these oh, things keep you know they keep moving forward because the vision i've set the goal it's like setting a sat nav i know where i'm going so I do have setbacks. I do come off and have a coffee from time to time and sort of have time out. And then I get back on the bike and I have another go because the vision drives me forward to leave this legacy and to make a difference in the world and to help families and kids. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's a, an enormous thing to get up in the, the morning for, isn't it? You know that when you don't get up, when you don't show up, there's a lot of families globally that are missing out on an extraordinary relationship, an extraordinary future. Uh, Simon, who's watching the call right now, you two definitely should connect if you haven't already. Uh, Simon also works with kids, but he does it from a completely different angle. Um, that, in fact, I think I mentioned Simon to you when we had our chat the other week. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's really important, I think, the power of collaboration um, and I know you're a massive collaborator aren't you tell us about some of the collaborations that you're working on right now as well as this amazing book well for me I think the world is much better when you collaborate I naturally like that I, I don't see it as just me I see it that we all work together we create a better whole pieces of jigsaw that's how I see it now I'm working on primary two now, I've been working for about nine months on that with Jo Fitzgerald of Aiding Mental Health. Also, she does something called Tiny Sponges. She's a former deputy head, and, and between us, we've got about 60 years, can you believe it, of yeah. experience in education. She's also an author. We came together because we looked at an area that we thought, you know, a lot of mental health things go wrong when kids get into about the 14 years, 15 years, self-harming, anxiety, depression, too much pressure on them to be perfect effect all of that so we thought let's bring it back when does this start and a lot of those problems begin when they go to secondary school that transition that sort of small primary where everyone's nurtured 
you are a big fish in a small pond then suddenly you go into this very large pond where you are very tiny. And some children don't handle that terribly well. So we have created videos, checklists, all sorts of things for parents, for children, but mainly actually for schools, that schools will buy the program that we have created and give it to the parents for free. And it's about the families doing this together, not just the schools. And of course, this became a fascinating moment in time because they left school in March, some children, in year six, and they're going to start school in year seven, possibly in September, maybe sooner. Who knows? That's the uncertainty of all of this. Not as well prepared by the teachers uh, and the schools as possibly they could be. So that's where our program has come into it. So this whole idea of you know helping families through videos, through talking, through community. And we haven't finished because we've had to stop recording and filming just at the moment. But we've got a whole thing nearly ready. And we've got a very interesting free ebook for anyone interested in handling the coronavirus time with school aged children. Go to primarysecondary.co.uk. It's free. We've written a, a workbook for parents and a workbook for kids. I hate the word workbook, but it's a kind of a journal and it's all for free, all around health. Give, us, give me that link again and I'll put it up on screen. Yeah, it's primary to secondary.co.uk. Go there, just sign up, and you can have the workbook for yourself as a parent and the workbook for the kids as well, which is all about your mental health, your well being, and supporting you through this time of challenge and change. Okay, fabulous. So um, I'm just trying to get that on screen. Did you say it's with the number two? Is that right? What is on thank screen you. now? Thank you. That's fantastic. Yes, thank oh, you. Right. Perfect. Perfect. Well, well, who wouldn't want that? I mean, you know, if you're a parent and <laughs> you've got you've got kids at home who are going into that next level. I mean, I mean, we've had um, you know Abby, our daughter, she, our youngest one, anyway. Um, she's 18, and like college is finished and it's well what's happening with university and there's a massive period of uncertainty for so many parents right now at all different ages I mean it's not at the young level it's going right the way up and um it's very interesting what's happening in the world right now and of course collaboration as you're bringing it back to collaborations what would you say because we've now started talking about collaborations I think this will be part of the angle that we talk about today um what would you say, what are the biggest lessons you've learned in partnering with other people to create products and programs? Um, interesting. I always, They have to have the same value system as I do. They, I am incredibly prolific. I learned that a long time ago, that I overwhelm people with my energy, with my passion, right. with my ability to write, create, make, do. I just have a great passion for my work and I have an ability to write and do a lot of things so I found for many years I couldn't quite find the person that matched me in fact I'm a real fan of Tony Robbins he was the only person I've met apart from Action Amanda who's very active um, but someone who actually matches my energy um, so yes I found that it's important to make sure what I call team fit in fact I was uh, coached for about three years by Tony Robbins coach because uh, I'm an NLP master practitioner and trainer myself and I use all that in my work but I wanted to be coached yeah. by someone further ahead than me so that would help me grow and develop and stretch and come out of my comfort zone and she said something important to me she said you know you need to have someone who's team fit and then the penny dropped because I can't wait for someone to drag their heels and take ages. And that's why working with Joe Fitzgerald of primary to secondary now, we match each other's energy. We have different skill sets which complement each other. And that has been a joy. Because when you meet like-minded people, then it's not hard work. You don't feel you drag. It's not stressful. It's a joy and a privilege. So make sure you have team fit. Whatever that team fit is for you. You don't have to be prolific like me or full of beans, but whatever it is, make sure it sits with you properly and certainly make sure the values align with your values. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that I learned through partnerships and I've partnered a lot is, um, you know, it's the, also the exit strategy. 
because you can partner with someone and they've got a totally different idea. Like, you know, I was building one of the businesses that I built. We were flying, you know, we were international. We'd built this big company. And then he decided that actually, you know, this isn't for me. And, and I only wanted to be a part of it for a couple of years anyway. And now I'm going to go find myself. It's like, don't you think that would have been a really good thing to share at the beginning? But when you're going into something like that, everything's rose-tinted and you just go for it. You don't think of asking these questions, do you? No, I suppose that's a bit like marriage, isn't it? People say, oh, I don't want to have a, you know, we don't want to talk about that sort of thing if it goes wrong. Because um, I specialise right. in helping families go through divorce as well, actually. But, uh, but actually, that's sensible. Um, you do need to make yeah. sure that you're aligned with that because if you've covered it and talked to about it then you have a similar vision or you understand and of course we've all got to be flexible on the journey life right. does throw out all sorts of things but I think you're right you do have to know that because if if you're in it and you think oh my goodness this is going to be fantastic for the next 10 years 15 years and the other person says well actually I only want to dip my toe into this for three then you're going to be misaligned aren't you Absolutely. Totally. Uh, it's, a, it's a big question. I remember the first, I'd set up my very first business back in 2002. I was so wet behind the ears. I had not a clue what I was doing. I'd been thrown into redundancy. So, you know, I totally started my first business from completely the wrong angle. And um, and I, the very first networking meeting I went to, someone said, you should be networking. And they dragged me along to this B&I meeting at oh, an earthly hour of, of the morning. And I'm like, half asleep and I walk into this meeting and this the first person that greets me shakes my hand I will always remember his name John Hart shakes my hand and he said what's your exit strategy he didn't ask me my name he didn't ask me what my business is what I do why I do it what's your exit strategy and I was just like look uh, 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 uh. <laughs> I didn't know <laughs> but it's so important to to understand like now I get it you know, don't build a business because you can build something that's around the life and the impact you want to make. I didn't get it back yeah. then. No, and I have it on my screensaver. You know, it reminds me every day when my computer comes up. It's not about making a million dollars. It's about reaching a million people. So that keeps me very aligned. And it makes me smile about BNI. And I'm not uh, negating it at all. But I remember having a one-to-one -one with a guy. And he said, so soon. Is it up me? hobby don't honestly anyway god bless him no it's not a hobby <laughs> <laughs> well there are some businesses that they 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 do they think that they're entrepreneurs and i meet a lot of people actually especially as i've gone around the world there's a lot of people that call themselves an entrepreneur when really what they are is a business owner and i mean that from a a, a mindset point of view mm. it'd be interesting to find out what you believe the difference is i mean it's obvious the difference between an employee and a business owner but what do you think is the uh, the difference between an, em a, 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 an entrepreneur and a business owner that's so interesting isn't it entrepreneurs have different sorts of energy i think they have this is only my take and you just asked me having thought about it but maybe they have a bigger vision for what they want to achieve. Um, they kind of go into something and see a very big picture to it. Uh, sometimes people have a business, they are in it and they don't, and they're working in it all the time. They don't work on it and they don't look out. Like I suppose you're saying an exit strategy. What's the way that you, I see it, what, what, what's the ending? How do you take yourself out of it? And therefore it still continues. A bit like the Jim Rowan, uh, who I used to admire very much and, and like, he is now no longer with us. But Jim Rowan's legacy and his, you know, business sort of stuff still keeps going on because he's out of it, but people can continue it. So there's the same sort of principle, really. Otherwise, you it, people think they go into entrepreneurialism because it's going to free them up um, from working. Uh, every hour, nine to five. And in fact, they do more because they change the light yeah. bulbs, they do the marketing, they like the content, they yeah. sell the product, they go on their bike and deliver it. That's not really working in a larger scale business. So you have to sort of look at how you can take yourself out of it possibly. So, you know, that then that frees you up. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good description. I mean, as I've traveled around the world, and maybe you found this as well, I tend to find that there's a different language between 
um, of when somebody's in a business owner mindset and when they're in entrepreneur mindset. And ultimately, we have to have both of them as a business owner, as an entrepreneur. You need to have both of these. I think it, the biggest thing is just realizing when you are in which energy and if you're meant to be in that energy or not. So I tend to find that um, an entrepreneur uses very different language. A business owner tends to say, how can I get more business? How can I grow the business? How can I build my team? How can I make more money? How can I market my business? So it's very, how can I, how can I, how can I? Because it's inward focus, like you said, working in the business. Whereas the entrepreneurs that I hang around with, and I'm sure you do, like they they are thinking much bigger. They, they the, the language they tend to use is, how can you? So they tend to be very you focused. So it's obviously more outward. And they say, well, how can you change your life as a result of something I know? You know, how could you change your health, wealth or happiness as a result of something I really fucked up on years ago? And I don't want you to go through that same thing or something that I've learned to do in 10 steps and you're trying to do it in 110. How can you change your life? And they tend to be very you focused. It's interesting, isn't it? When you think about energy because if you're building your business or working on a marketing strategy you, you, yes you need to be you focused as in in the shoes of the customer but you've got to be focused on your business in your business at some point it's just if you stay there it can become quite a dangerous game because then you end up like you said that you think you're an entrepreneur but really what you've done is bought yourself the worst job working the worst hours and you're the worst boss <laughs> of yourself <laughs> And a lot of people leave their jobs because they're very good at them and then they think that they can create a business around that. Now, there's a big difference between creating a business with all the different components that you have to get good at because you do have to get good at them or, what I do, um, you delegate them to the people that are experts. I, I remember going on a call by Roger, oh, what's his name? I can't remember. But he talked about you have a star, which is the, the creator, the star creator. Then you have a oh, deal breaker. That's it. That's him. I went on his course. I mean, you've got to keep learning. I was forever going on courses, reading books, you and watching videos. Because uh, yeah. you're always learning. And some of these things, they work for people. Then you, you've been around the block a bit and you think, oh, yeah, I've heard all this before. But um, I liked what he said. And I thought, oh, I can see where I fit here. So it's a waste of my time spending three hours learning to code this or add this to my website. I need a VA or I need someone to go in yeah. and do the deal for me. Uh, so I'm not negotiating perhaps on some of these things because it's uncomfortable to talk about money or something. So, you know, you have different people around you for different things. Not because you're a prima donna, because it's not a useful thing. Of, I'd rather be writing a book or an article than be doing something, you know, that's a bit mundane on my website, for example. Totally. I think recognizing who you are, and I talk about that quite a bit. Um, I went out to South Africa with Roger to his um, game reserve last year. And I don't know if you went out there and you did your stuff there, but um, yeah, I really learned a lot about myself and my team. And in fact, we came back from that knowing, because uh, I took my operations director with me, and we came back from that knowing I'm a creator star mechanic. If I'm not creating something, I'm not happy. I need to be creating. And, and then I go into putting the light on others and putting the light on it and then making it. So I, I don't know. What, what profile are you? I'm the same. Create a star. And they will go, oh, oh yeah, you, you love the line. <laughs> <laughs> but then you know, what we realized was that we had these leadership teams all around the world um, you know, looking after our Brand Builders Club members and building it. So uh, one of the things we realized that our team – in the Netherlands, for example, our team in New York, our team in Brisbane, Australia, we realized we had the right teams, but in the wrong roles. And it was just a case of switching them. And oh my goodness, I can't believe the difference that it made. Just understanding, you know, we've done disc profiles, we've done many other things, but the wealth dynamics profiling, I think is a brilliant way of being able to really tell how you can grow yourself and grow your team. That's one of the things I really love about the the system that Roger's developed. Oh, it's so funny looking through it as well. Yeah, amazing. Oh, well, yeah, you keep learning, don't you? That's the thing. And there's loads of people out there. And, you know, you, the thing is um, there's different styles of it. Some people will teach you how to do it. 
Uh, and, and I always tend to like and think, well, could you do that for me? I'd rather pay for that to be done for me, actually, because it's a waste of my time and I could be creating, writing or yeah. filming or doing something. Uh, so you get to know your strengths. And, you know, then it's a good idea to delegate some of your weaknesses, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I'm not a fan of them. And I don't think I've ever been a fan when, you know, people say, well, you've got to turn your weaknesses into strengths. No, you don't. <laughs> why? Why? I mean, there's certain things that you can do, but why do you have to try really hard to be something that's not natural to you? Well, as an educator, often we push children who say, I don't like math. Well, no, of course you do. Come on. And you spend hours and months and years trying to make them into to love math. Is it just me? But I'm not a huge fan of that. That's why I yeah. married a chartered accountant, no doubt. However, but, what, but also, there is that sort of thing. Of course, you've got to have tenacity. Of course, you've got to have thick ability. Of course, you've got to push through and master some things. And that's, I think, what a lot of people do. They dabble, and then they yeah. move on to the next thing, and they dabble, and they never master. And it takes years of tenacity to master yeah. something. But with kids as well, in particular, you know, perhaps it, they're never going to be, um, you know, fascinated by English or writing stories then perhaps that you know you should encourage them where their strengths are which is in engineering or making or doing so there's this balance isn't there between sticking with something and on the other hand don't keep pushing yeah. against something that right. really is just too hard and it's not otherwise yeah. it doesn't flow does it no I mean there's so many people if you oh gosh well I know probably at least a thousand people out of my whole network who well, everyone I've ever coached, basically, they've they've been pushed to go in one direction, and usually because of a parent pushing them to be something or to do something, and you know, and they get to their forties, and then they they just say, you know, that the parent has died or whatever, and then they start to do the thing, and it's such a shame. I just always feel like, wow, you know, to have a spirit that's dampened, you know, mm -hmm. hidden in the shadows for so long, to then bring that out i mean aren't we all really children at heart sue oh well childlike hopefully not childish but yeah i mean the whole point <laughs> is to develop whatever strengths your kids have nurture them encourage them this is actually a really interesting time lockdown because for so many years we've been focused on league tables and ofsted reports and data and perhaps this is an opportunity without being all madly homeschooled trying to tell people to calm down but perhaps it's an opportunity for them to discover they love painting or they love pottering around in the garden and designing a zoo in their imagination they could actually get really interested and passionate about something where it could be sewing i don't know what it could be but it's an opportunity to broaden your child's education at the moment uh, and I think this could be a very interesting time for this generation of children who are the class of 2020. Yes, very interesting. I mean, well, you know, how long do you think it's going to take for us to be able to see the effect of that? Goodness me, that's very interesting. I don't know. I've been sort of walking the dog and philosophising and talking to my friend, Dr. Lynn Kenny, who's across the pond. She's my pal across the pond. She's very similar to me, but she's in America. And we've done some videos as well talking around how things may change after this. It's it's far too soon, isn't it? We're still right in the eye of the storm, certainly here in the UK. We don't know. Um, but I want to make sure that children are not damaged emotionally or traumatised by this experience. And, of course, that comes from the parent. If parents are positive, if they are confident, if they are handling this situation uh, you know, carefully with stability and, and security. Children will not come through this damaged. And, you know, it doesn't matter if they don't know their seven times table between March and September. It's quite handy if they need to know some of these things later on. But you can pick it up and run with the ball later on. So we won't particularly know how it will impact on all of our lives, actually. But I certainly, I don't know about you, it, it does seem, I do miss my cup of coffee with some of my friends or being able to hug my daughter who I haven't seen for about a month. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, I feel like this has been a massive time of, um, you know, we talk about this with kids, but I think 
a lot of the adults I know are really, they're exploring, they're experimenting different things and people are doing different things to bring the community together. Uh, a friend of mine, Kim, she, um, she's a real bookworm. She's a word nerd. She loves anything to do with writing, reading. You know, if there are words on it, she's in it and she's just lapping it up. It's just delicious to her to read yeah. or to, to hear someone read something. And she just put a readathon on on um, Easter Sunday and, uh, and she put it out to a, a few of her, her close friends and she said, you know, would you come and read for 30 minutes? Uh, you know, would just going to go live on the Facebook page and you know we're just going to give some people that are at home that would usually be at church or you know whatever that are missing their families Let, let's just give them a distraction for a day and um anyway we she gave us this list of books that we could look at um which were kind of out in the public domains so there was no copyright issues or anything and when I looked I saw that Anne of Green Gables was on the list Oh, oh my god, I used to watch that with my grandma and it just brought so many <laughs> It's so funny since I said I'm gonna read Anne of Green Gables. So anyway, I read this 30 minutes of it and, and I thought I got off that call and I thought I really enjoyed reading that. Oh my god, why have I not thought of doing this already? So I phoned my brothers. I've got well, I've got three brothers and a sister, and I phoned two of my brothers up and I said, Hey, look, why don't I just read to the kids at bedtime a couple of times a week? Because I'm really missing them and I don't know how to communicate with them any other way. It's like, you know, you're FaceTiming, how are you? What have you been up to? What are you doing? And it kind of, you know, it's like I like to have a purpose. <laughs> so um now that's what we're doing, you know, a couple of times a week. And I did one last night and I read two stories and came off it. And I felt so full and complete after doing that. And it was like, oh, that was lovely. So I think there are a lot of things that are happening, actually, that are bringing people closer together online. Um, yeah. yeah. It's going to be lovely when we can see each other again. But I'm having more contact with them than I had before when I could see them physically. Isn't it funny? This, which was funny. Because, um, because um, just launched, uh, I, I co-wrote a book called Antiviral and the Virus with Tina Stubbs. She wrote, she's, uh, she writes Life's Little Bugs and she creates habits. And then we thought we'd, we, we noticed that there was a, a, a gap around the story. So she wrote and drew all the pictures of antiviral and the virus, how to stay safe, how to explain it to kids without scaring them. And <laughs> I've just today released it where I read the story and it reminded me of me being a teacher when I used to sit with the book facing that way the children all around me because I, I taught ages four to eleven and I used to teach reception so I used to hold the book that way and so it's just released now and all the proceeds are going to the NHS we've done it for oh, free wow. but check it out if you want it it's all in the prime and the are fantastic and it's on youtube uh, under the sue atkins parenting expert page now it's just gone up this afternoon uh, and i love doing it because stories are wonderful and i think what you've said there reading a story to a child is such a personal lovely way to bond with them and also the other thing i was seeing on twitter actually uh, jeff barton who is um, high up in one of the teachers unions he was saying it's a simple thing for parents just listening to this about wanting to help their kids read because i did it so kids could read along with me on the video um but also if you turn on the uh, the words at the bottom you know when you're watching any tv show or any program yeah. with kids and the words it absolutely takes their reading through the roof because they start yeah. reading along as they're watching yeah and honestly that's such a simple thing and for me if we can create a whole group of kids that love books and love stories like you said and love reading yeah, yeah. Then that lockdown was worth it well you know for me yeah <laughs> Totally, I totally get it. Totally get it. And it is, brings about a kind of connection that, that I think we've all been missing for a long time. Now, Sue, give me that again. So the Sue Atkins Parenting Expert page on Facebook, did you say? Yeah, no, it's on YouTube today. YouTube. It's on my YouTube channel. Yeah, and you can listen along to it. And at the back of it, we've done some exercise, you know, not exercise, what they're called, activities. And then yeah. the other couple of pages... Uh, I, I have loads of people I know around fantastic resources for children and parents, not about pushing homeschooling. This is not about famous people. This is not about, oh, do Joe Wicks at 9.30, then do Marlene Class at 11, then do David Williams at half 11. These are really wonderful people that I know personally through my Twitter feed and through my years of doing my podcast. And I wanted to recommend them. My Mood Stars, SDM Blog Resources. She writes this wonderful, wonderful 
blog, but it's more than that, all around special needs. Um, there are so many people on there. Ellie Dix, all about board games, you know, small ones, big ones, long ones, short ones. Wonderful resources there. So check out Antiviral and the Virus on YouTube, and I'll turn up there because I've only just gone live this afternoon. Okay. Anti, what did you call it? Anti? Ant, I, viral, and the virus. That's <laughs> the name. Ah. He's a bit of a detective and he tells you how to keep yourself safe. And uh, there's a lovely little thing. I don't know if you know, we're going on a bear hunt. You know that one yes. that the kids love? It just, it's got a rhythm to it, too. I'm on a mission. A mission, you see. And it goes off like that. <laughs> uh, oh, I can't wait. You know what's funny is as I was looking through and trying to find stories for the kids, um, I was finding all kinds of stuff. And as I was reading through them, I was enjoying them as much as they were, I think. <laughs> yeah, sure, because we're all the same. And if you get, you know, into your kind of child mood, it's fantastic. <laughs> Playing with them, reading with them, listening yeah. to them, baking with them. I talk all about ING activities. You know, we used to talk about cycling and bowl, going bowling. But now it's gardening, it's cooking, it's baking, it's building a den in the garden. Whatever it is, ING means you're getting involved and stuck in with your kids. And if you get a bit frustrated, you think, oh, I can't play all day with them. If you sit down on the floor and just in your head go, oh, this is for a minute, Sometimes children need you to go alongside them to get them started. So if you do it in your head oh, for, for a minute, then they can get started and they start playing or getting engaged in what it is. And then you can slip away and do your 45 minutes of work. Because I think everyone has to do little bursts of work if you're a mum at home. So you're not trying to do four hours and say, get away, get away. And another yeah. simple tip I'm on it is to have a jar and put in inside the jar just 20 minute activities or 15 to 20 minute activities that if you are a bit busy and the kids say, oh, you know, I'm bored or I've got, you've got a 15 minute activity they can pluck out, have a look and go and do. Something very simple, but it's it gives you that flexibility for working if you're trying to work from home. Brilliant. Brilliant. I'm sure those of you that are watching that uh, that have kids that, that could use that strategy, I would definitely be putting that in place. So let's talk about your your real confessions. So we started just like skirting on the, the icing on the cake at the beginning of the show. Let's get deep and dirty now. Let's go to a time when you've got a confession about something you don't talk about very often, but has happened to you in your business career where you would never ever do it like that again and and somebody watching the show could say oh thank god it's not just me or no oh, that's happening to me oh my god thank goodness that you shared that so would you dive into a, a confession for us well yes um websites and people that say they will build you um a cathedral and you you know you agonize over it and you give them all of your hard-earned money or your money that you may have inherited when your parents died and uh, you know they build it and it's a shack or it's not a shack but whatever it is it, it doesn't doesn't change your life to that extent that you think it will and you keep on you've got to kind of know this difference between when to keep pushing and keep going and when to say like Seth Godin says you know when to call that a day I think the whole point with all of these things is you keep learning though and sometimes you know you I used to beat myself up when I made some terrible mistakes like that certainly financial ones or I gave away my power to the wrong person so for example with the webmaster I couldn't change anything myself you know uh, I'd have to keep going back to them and it'd be another 300 quid and you think god it's just hemorrhaging away and it makes you anxious and I used to get very uh, upset about that and beat myself up about it and think how could I be so silly so you keep learning to really simplify it and if you can do things yourself uh, I'm thinking of a friend that we both mutually know who tends to give away her power too much to too many people uh, I think you have to sit down at a certain point and actually say what part of this business can I actually control myself and I yeah. can do myself? But it's not wasting my time, but is actually taking control of my own. For example, my own social media, I do all of that myself. Now, it would be lovely to have, you know, somebody wonderful doing extraordinary things for me, but I don't know who these people are half the time. And in the end, 
my social media is really me, my voice, my energy, my passion, my personality. So, but I often take a dog walk and I pause to ponder what's important. And I do it quite regularly because of the mistakes I have made. And now I've got it quite tight. And it is basically me making decisions here and making decisions there, working with the right people, like I work with Disney or I work with Danone or I work with, with large companies uh, like Parent Mail. Um, so that, um, you know, I feel supported in my decisions and I take time not to make knee jerk ones because it's expensive if you keep making wrong decisions, isn't it? It totally is. And, and I think that's such a good message. Thank you for sharing that. And it's, it's something that's happened to me. It still happens, by the way, guys and girls. For those of you that are watching now, it still happens. And I think, you know, there's this fine balance, isn't there, between trust so that you can let go to grow and then there's stupidity <laughs> in, in like yeah. I, I was very silly um in my in my younger days when I I say my younger days we're only going back about seven years ago but um you know you do make mistakes and you learn from them unfortunately and and I remember think, hearing about outsourcing oh my goodness me when I learned about outsourcing I was yeah. like a pig in doodah at first. And I was like, yes, I can outsource this, I can outsource that. Yeah. And when I found out, you know, it was very cheap to be able to outsource to people in other parts of the world where that is like an executive wage for them. And for us, it's peanuts. And I was like, brilliant. Okay, I'm going to outsource everything. And I gave control of pretty much everything out. And then, of course, you, you get rid of it and you think, oh, phew, great. Someone else is on with that. And then the questions start. And then you end up with like hours and hours of work to do, which, you know, if you were to do it yourself, you would just get on and do it. But you forget that other people, like what, what we communicate in here and what we communicate out of that to someone else, very different things. And then you end up with something coming back to you that you think, why have they sent me that? that but it, the meaning of your communication is the response you get. And so I had to learn very much how to communicate if I was going to delegate. And maybe that's something that you had to go through as well. So oh, as your <laughs> delegation as strategy. As you're thinking, oh, my God, I remember it. Because what I did is, and I made a massive mistake, I delegated the task, but I delegated the responsibility. Mm. Now, when I delegate a task, I hold the person accountable. I said, when are you going to get that done? By Wednesday at 3 o'clock. How are we going to get that? Can you feed back to me in the way I like to be fed back to? Can we have a catch-up call every Friday, please, at 3 o'clock? Because that's the end of the week. I like a catch-up call with real people, not emails all the time. That's the big mistake that I made. I delegated the task. And I delegated the responsibility. And now I don't do that. I delegate the task because it's sometimes worth doing that. But I hold the person accountable and I keep control of it. It doesn't go away from me. I love that as a, as a theme. Delegate the task but not the responsibility. Mm. I think there's a lot of business owners that can learn from that one alone. Because it's so easy, especially if you go into a partnership, which is what we talked about in the beginning of this call. Whether you go into a partnership with a, in a joint venture capacity or whether you partner with somebody to, you know, they write something and you do the promotion for it. Or, you know, you've got to think about there's so many different ways to collaborate, aren't there? And I think we are in the age now of collaboration and championship of ourselves and others and others championing us to the rest of the world. And so never before have we needed to communicate clearer than we have about who we are and why we do what we do. Um, you know, and all the people that keep talking about what they do, they're kind of going to the back of the queue. It's very interesting to see the personal brands that are emerging now are the ones that have a really big purpose. They're focused on purpose rather than profit. It's very interesting. It is interesting. And the other thing I've learned, um, for example, I do my podcast every week and I interview a guest and I've done about 80 guests like you do here. Yeah. And the purpose of that was to get expertise for my parenting club. But also it was to spread my work and my, my you know, everything that I do in my parenting club to their 
um, followers and fans and people. And I have been disappointed in that sometimes because I'm such a collaborator. I expected other people to be as collaborative as me, and they don't. They tend to be a bit hoardy, and it's about my business. Yeah. And so it has been a disappointment to me, and I've had to learn to discern is what I say really um who, who are these people um you know will they spread my work just as enthusiastically as I spread yeah. theirs on my social media on my website and praising them but I also believe in karma actually the, you know I, I tend to believe that if I'm doing good work and I'm doing a good job then you know it will come back to me eventually <laughs> um, I, I totally believe that. I love um, is it Abraham Hicks that says the universe always delivers in proportion to what you put out to it. And you may like be thinking, well, I've done this for this person and I'm not seeing anything come back. But what you're not seeing is it's coming from somewhere else and you're not even acknowledging it or being grateful for it because it's coming in from there and you're not expecting it. <laughs> it always comes back somehow. Yes, and I think you've got to learn to be grateful about all sorts of things. Having that positive attitude, having that kind of energy, it's just good for your soul anyway and keeps you going, keeps you motivated. And surrounding yourself by like-minded people too. I have some good pals. There's about two pals that we speak often, we text, we phone, we keep an eye on each other, we lift each other up. And it's great to have that yeah, support network. That. You know? And also not to be falsely about when you have a bad day or things go a bit wrong. But they don't leave you in that pity party. They say, right, well, okay, that is terrible, that is awful. And then they'll check in on you the next day and go, right, what's next? What are you doing tomorrow to get back up and bouncing back again? Yeah, everybody needs that. And if you don't have it, make it um, one of your missions to go and get it. Now, Sue, out of all the business coaches that you've ever had, and I'm sure you've had a few uh, you know, in your time of different different skills, different levels, you talked about how you were coached by Tony Robbins' coach. Um, what was the best piece of advice that you've been given by one of those coaches? Um, I think I come back to Nancy, who was, and I mentioned her earlier in the sense of um, map, people who are team fit. They have your values, they have your energy, they have the bigger vision, and they hold you, you know, you feel equal. A bit like in relationships, actually. If you don't feel equal in a relationship, it's never going to work. So yeah. the same thing with the business thing. And I think coming back to that, when I think of all the different things I've learned, that's one of those things that people, People have that equality with, with and lining up with the vision that I have for the world and for what I want to achieve. Yeah, it's a big one. And and when you're not aligned and you're not going in the same direction, it causes a lot of pain. I definitely speak from experience there. It drags your energy, doesn't it? It takes away from you and enhances you. Totally. And and you'll find pretty early on as one of one of the uh, the best things that, that one of my business coaches um, he said to me in one of our first sessions he said Sammy the thing you've got to get good at as a business owner of a global business is to recognise upside down rockets as fast as possible and I was like recognise upside down rockets what do you mean by that and he had this workbook and he says right turn to page whatever it was. And there's a picture of this upside down, like NASA space shuttle, upside down, smoke coming out of it, ready to go. And he said, what would you do if you if you walked up to that and you saw that? I said, I'd run. <laughs> he went, exactly. <laughs> he said, when you, you've got to recognize upside down rockets in your business. And, you know, there are people that will be upside down rockets and you want to avoid them. There'll be problems in your business that you can avoid. And the key thing is spotting an upside down rocket before it becomes something, before it looks like it's going to take off. He said, you know, what you've got to do is always look at, as soon as you're aware that there's a problem, is to think, when did that problem start? When was the first time I noticed that that was a problem? Yeah. And like really look at it and you just go, oh, my God, there were so many things that he was like, yep, yeah, upside down rocket, upside down rocket, upside down. I was just That's seeing upside down rockets everywhere. Yeah, because my friend Karen, who is a fantastic therapist in, in Ireland, I remember asking her something and something had gone wrong and we were chatting and she said, so, Sue, when did you override your intuition? And I went, oh, my God, yeah, I... Oh, 
I re- yes, and I remember then, and I thought, oh, and I hope that is the biggest question, and it's a really good one to pause to ponder. Yeah, uh, that's why I think it's good to take those dog walks or do whatever you do to um, ground yourself and just check in on yourself now and again. Is that you know how does this feel working with this person or doing this thing? Yeah. How does it does it feel right to me? Because normally that is your intuition guiding you. And I don't think you can go too far wrong. You've got to use your head and you've got to use your heart. Don't come from here too much. But if you get the two of them in balance, you can go forward with confidence. Yeah, it uh, it makes a huge difference when everything's in alignment, and it makes Absolutely. everything so much harder and obviously longer. <laughs> When you you go against your gut instinct, like how many of you have gone against a, a gut instinct in your life, and you look back on it now? You know, I, actually, one of my boat neighbours, she she lives in a, a couple of boat doors down, and um, and we were in the car park. I was walking one of my dogs the other night, and I bumped into her, and uh, and I said, "How are you doing?" And of course, we're social distancing across each other from the bins. Like, how are you doing? And she said, "Oh, you know, work's a nightmare," and. I'm really not enjoying it. And it's so, you know, they're trying to send us home to do this and I can't do what I need to do. And she was obviously clearly stressed about it. And um, and I just asked her some of these questions that we're, we're talking about now. And she was like, oh, my God, I've got to go and give my notice in. Uh, and I was like, OK. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it just takes somebody to ask you a question. You know, like, like when did you start to become unhappy about this? And she was like, blah, 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 this happened and that happened. She actually lost her voice for six months. She went mute for six months. That's how stressed she is in this job. And you just think, wow, like she just couldn't communicate. Like she couldn't, she just didn't feel like she could communicate. And I just think, wow, you know, there's so many people on the planet who, you know, I know I've been in relationships years before I actually ended it. And I think, God, you know, I wasted two years of my life trying to make it work, thinking that I'd be a failure if I didn't. And I think it's recognising those upside down rockets, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I've never heard that expression before, but it really will resonate with me. It's a really good idea because loads of people that say, you know, so uh, I just couldn't do it. I just don't want to do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. And that's when you start to look into, you know, what are your alternatives? And I remember that when I was teaching, being a deputy head and class teacher and, you know, quite overwhelmed, quite tired. Uh, I could do it with my eyes closed in in many ways because it wasn't a challenge. And I picked up a really great book and I remember reading it. And the question was, you know, what what would you do if you just stayed doing that for the rest of your life? And I just remember going, oh, my goodness, I can't do this anymore because I'll have enormous regret. And one book I really recommend because I'm in lockdown with it, uh, I decided I read it 10 years ago. I absolutely loved it. And I'm rereading it now after 10 years of doing what I'm doing, picking up gems, is Jack Canfield, The Success Principles. I highly recommend that to everyone listening today. I don't know if you've read it. It's a brilliant book. I have not, actually. That's one that I have not watched. Um, I've actually, I'm interviewing, um, I've got uh, somebody that I'm interviewing next week who is running a big event with all, most of the, uh, the the most famous secret cast. And uh, so I'm interviewing him, I think, next week or the end of this week. And so, yeah, he's doing some good stuff with Jack Canfield. They're very good friends. Um, the success principle is Jack Canfield. Well, yeah, that's a great recommendation. I know of it, but I've never, ever read it. Fabulous. Sue, I, I I could talk to you all day. Like you you just have, you you just have that spirit and that energy of <laughs> I'm sure everybody wants to be around it. But we have come to the end of our time now. Claire Claire Ford, who's on here now, she said she'd love to connect with you She's in the same niche. So I'll make sure I connect the two of you. Um Claire, Claire, I've known Claire for a long, long time. She's amazing. So yeah, I will connect you, Claire. Uh, just remind me if I forget. Um so I just want to thank you with all of my heart and send you love and gratitude and blessings for you being able to make the time to be here today to support other entrepreneurs just like us who, you know, they want to remember that they're human and that shit happens and that there are some things that we've learned that people don't need to learn. And uh, I want to thank you for bringing that energy to the call today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And we're all here to help each other. You know, it's nice to be able to reach down and help people and help them not make the same mistakes that we made. You're going to make different ones, 
But yeah. don't make the same ones as we do. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It's not necessary. Well, thank you so much, guys and girls, for listening. We'll be back tomorrow at 5 p.m. BST again. Same time, same place. And, uh, and we've got another amazing interview lined up for you. A bit more inspiration, bringing you totally different entrepreneurs from different backgrounds all over the world. Uh, let's see who we've got on the show tomorrow. Uh, gosh, the time is flying already. It's crazy. We have the amazing Sharon Gaskin. Sharon runs oh, an amazing company. Yeah. Do you? Sharon, yeah. uh, she has a company called Trainer Talks. For those of you that don't know Sharon, um, she if you are a trainer, speaker, an author, uh, somebody who's a consultant going out and, and now is a time when you're thinking business is, is down on what you were expecting with your cash flow. Let's see if we can change that. Tomorrow I'm going to be interviewing Sharon. She is absolutely awesome. Um, and then um, Raymond, the guy I was talking about earlier, who's working with Jack Kenfield, he's on Wednesday. So uh, we've got Christy Whitman. Um, no, Christy is a bit later on in the month. Yeah, we've got some amazing people coming up. We've got the amazing Simon Ben, who is on the call right now as well, coming up. So if you have not been interviewed on the Confessions of a Global Changemaker show yet, do reach out to me. I'd love to, to support you getting your message out to the world. So I'm sending you all my love. Let's keep connected and let's keep it going. Amanda, thank you for introducing me to Sue. You're always a guiding light in my life. Have an amazing evening. Take care and uh, we'll be back. We'll see you in the group tomorrow. Mwah. See ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.